Hello, I'm Sandra Chevy, and this week we're going to be revisiting my interview with director James Goldstone. I interviewed James when he was filming the Kent State tragedy in Alabama. Uh, it was a night shoot, and I think you can hear the crickets on the interview if you listen uh, carefully. I got to know James through Verna Fields when she took over as the first woman vice president head of production at Universal Studios. James was doing films by that time, and Kent State was a reversion uh, to doing a television because he was so enamored of the project. The project is important in that the tragedy of Kent State has to do as much with the murder of students as the murder of Jewish students. I think uh, nine out of ten of those injured and murdered were Jews. So Goldstone felt quite passionately about it and took uh, on the TV project on that basis. I took him to task because I felt and feel that he makes uh, an invidious distinction in the project in terms of casting. Uh, that is to say, all of the Jews are good Jews, uh, rich, uh, assimilated, uh, very good looking. And it didn't surprise me to discover that James was chosen by Gene Roddenberry to do a pilot for Star Trek, because uh, to my mind, Star Trek is a hideously racist concept, pitting a good Jew against bad Jew, a good Jew being Shatner, bad Jew being uh, Nimoy. Nonetheless, James Goldstone was a very, very good friend of mine, and he was a very committed individual. He was very committed to feminism and gender equality, uh, race equality, faith equality, uh, etc. James Goldstone, Mel Brooks, and Robert Aldridge took out adverts on my behalf in Daily Variety to promote me as a possible film critic for the Los Angeles Times. And for this, I will always smile when I think of James Goldstone. It was uh, wonderful talking with him, and I hope you enjoy the interview. It was just an emotional response on the part of people who resented long hair, who resented kids who were of middle class, who resented Everything that's going casting, on. In casting, uh, three of the four kids were Jews. In casting, did you, and I was told, I mean, supposedly were very assimilated, were not, uh, you know, aligned with any radical groups or radical interests, or even particularly not, except from Sandy, from the screenplay, was ostent was very uh, flagrantly uh, Jewish. Flagrantly Jewish, that's an interesting term. She well, was obviously Jewish. Flagrantly Jewish, yes. Um, I mean, you know, is there any more Jewish? The kids, who, the kids who play Jews are Jews. I'm saying, is it, was there any thought on your part, perhaps, to, to cast them differently, which might have given you know, a different interpretation? No. no. Uh, I did not I did not tell our casting directors to bring on only Jewish actors to play Jews. Mm -hmm. But they were from New it York? Turned out, it turned out Jane Fleiss is Jewish. Uh, Keith Gordon, who plays Jeff Miller, is Jewish. Balsam? Uh, Talia Balsam, yeah. who plays Sandy, is Jewish. Uh, uh, Jeff... Um, it's terrible. Uh, uh, Barry? No, the, the Barry, the, the yeah. person who plays Barry is right. not. Charlie Lang is not Jewish. But uh, Jeff McCracken, who plays uh, Bill Schroeder, who was not Jewish, is not Jewish. Okay. It turns out that yeah. way. No, I just thought it, whether it would change things conceptually if, in fact, they, 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 they were not Jews, which simply... No, I don't think it really had... It had to do with their lives and who they were, but it, it was it, a total it, accident if that you it cast, was if Jews. If you cast Jews, it might, it might, there might be a greater sense of fatalism. Look at that. Going here. In the sunset, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I thought that, you know, they might, because they are Jews, it might have given us a heightened sense of fatalism and predestination. Um, possibly, possibly. Uh, and possibly that's why Bill Schroeder was more ambivalent. Because he wasn't, he was very much a, a, a wasp from Lorraine. Yeah, yeah he thought he was going to... However, however, none of those kids. Alison Krauss was the most alive person imaginable. She was touching, you know, sticking her big toe in any I didn't say drop not, of water I didn't that we buy. Not being alive, but there is also a sense of uh, fatality. She, I don't think had she any had, sense of fatality. I don't think okay. any of them did. Jeff Miller was a little boy lost, who sort of found himself yeah. that weekend because something was happening All finally. Right, talk. You said the girl when Allison was dying. I guess when she had this. You said Jane Fleiss was, Jane was Fleiss playing was, the death. Yeah, and I mean, you said simply physically, it was such an arduous. But was there, I mean, Psychologically, too, to lie yeah. in your own blood. How did you have to deal with it? How did you have to hype it? How did more you calm less, them down? Were you, father, were you a priest figure, a, father, a rabbi figure father, during this thing? Father figure. I have become uh, 
a father figure to most of the kids. A father, camp counselor, director, psychologist. But particularly this thingy. I mean, dealing with this particular well, thing. How do you de how do you get someone to play the part? To deal with it, to deal with it rationally, I guess, enough, and then be able to really kind of have the catharsis. Well, the catharsis should be in the playing, but it cannot be because it isn't complete. And uh, you do films and fractured pieces, so uh, you did deal you, with them as a human being. Did you tend to get them to think of other things? Did you try and no, divert their attention? No, I tried to let it become perspective sometimes. I said, it is a film we are making. Mostly what I did was try to deal with their craft and say, you cannot play your predestination. You must play your aliveness. But that day when lying in their own blood, they could not play their aliveness, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Any other kinds of things? I mean, I heard one girl got hysterical. I mean, she was absolutely hysterical. Absolutely. A lot of people have gotten hysterical. Really? What do you do? Comfort Hold them? them. Last night, uh, uh, an invented character, a representative, uh, sort of flitty... Uh, uh, protester, a uh, uh, marvelous actress from Atlanta, uh, you just heard me talking about with the art director, I had her break the bank window which was broken oh, that yeah. night, and both the fury that she felt personally in throwing her spray paint cans, because she goes around yeah, paint I mean. and the danger of this huge plate glass window breaking, because yeah. it was not fake glass, there right. was no way of doing it. Uh, I held her for about five minutes in my arms as a father would as a small child as she trembled. Yeah, really. Out of a combination of expended fury and fear. Really. Well, it must be horrible being in a situation, you know, uh, these situations of conflagration of, you know. Of, well, I will say that you haven't asked about me in terms of that. Yes, uh, you know, I will. It got I to am. me once. And it got to me, I mean, I, I have been directing film for some time, and, and you think you are steeled and inured to anything, but, you know, you deal with the technical things, and you deal with the, or to, you, you try and have an overview rather than become involved, and then you let yourself be involved while the take is on, and then you cut it down and you say, wait a minute, analytically, the, there was a shadow on the face or something like that. One day, the day we were about to do the shots of the guardsmen, the 28 guardsmen shooting. Yes. I was shooting another sequence leading up to it. Right. And I had told the prop man, our property master, that we would be shooting two hours hence, three hours hence, shooting the M1 rifles. Well, since they are plugged, non-functional M1 rifles, that is to say they will not fire real bullets, they're not, and they're props, so they're, right. they're not in the greatest shape. He took 28 rifles, I guess, around the other side of a building and started lubricating them and trying them with blanks. And progressively, over a period of two hours, I started hearing those gunshots. And I was doing other things. Mm -hmm. And it started getting to me in a visceral way. I mean, not just a, a, an intellectual or psychological yes, way. Yes, yes. In a visceral way, and I started feeling ill. And I had a great, great difficulty pulling myself out of it and concentrating on what was right. happening. 